Hello, my friends. I'm happy to present the first Winders documentary in American land. I'm also glad to see the nice job that our collaborator Connor Doran has done visiting the amazing winemakers of the Finger Lakes, a truly outstanding area. Do you like Riesling? And actually, I love it. Well, the Finger Lakes has the best Riesling that you can find. From very dry styles to sweet, to even sparkling like this one. Well, really, really good wines. Enjoy the ride. I'll see you soon. Hey, I'm here in Geneva, New York, in the beautiful New York Finger Lakes wine producing area. And behind me is Seneca Lake, the largest and most influential lake for grape growing in the region. The Finger Lakes AVA is the best known out of the 10 American Viticultural Areas, or AVAs, in the state of New York. This region produces world-class wines and is renowned for their Riesling, Chardonnay, and Cabernet Franc, as well as fantastic Pinot Noir and Gewürztraminer. The unique geography of these sloping landscapes, tucked in between 11 finger-shaped lakes, provide the ideal growing condition by drawing cool air off the vines. This keeps the vines warm to aid in a long, healthy growing season. The Finger Lakes' impressive topography, along with some of the most innovative producers in wine, will make this a journey you won't want to miss. The Finger Lakes are located in northwest New York and sit just below Lake Ontario and the Canadian border. Established in 1982, the Finger Lakes AVA is the largest grape growing region in New York with just under 4,000 hectares under vine. Its northern location makes it one of the coldest AVAs in the entire U.S. This region encompasses 11 lakes including Seneca and Cayuga Lakes which both have their own American viticultural areas within the Finger Lakes AVA. The Finger Lakes were carved by a wave of glaciers thousands of years ago. This created deep cuts hundreds of feet below sea level. Although modern grape growing in the Finger Lakes took off in the 60s and 70s, this region is no stranger to viticulture. Early settlers began planting native vines along the lakes in the 1800s. Following the repeal of Prohibition, production was dominated by only a few wineries. Many growers struggled with Vitis vinifera, the popular European vines, as these vines could not withstand the cold, cold and brutal New York weather. In the early 1950s, Ukrainian immigrant Dr. Konstantin Frank came to the Cornell University Geneva experiment. Dr. Frank grafted Vitis vinifera grapes like Riesling and Chardonnay onto American rootstock. He quickly learned that these hardy rootstocks could support these European grapes 
and he completely transformed grape growing in the Finger Lakes. In 1976, New York's Farm Winery Act allowed for the expansion of wineries and the ability to sell directly to the public. Well, the rest is history and the New York wine scene truly began to flourish. Hey, I'm here with Megan, uh, the fourth generation wine grower at Dr. Constantine Frank. Megan, it's great to see you, great to be here with you. Can you Thank talk you, to me Connor. a little bit about uh, what we've got here behind us? Yes, absolutely. So we're standing on our Cuca Lake Farm. We're here in the beautiful Finger Lakes region. And we have some really old vines here. You know, starting with my great-grandfather, Constantine, he pioneered vinifera, the European varieties, to the eastern United States. So right here we have some Chardonnay, so the vines are dormant because it is winter time. But um, you can see the trunks on some of these vines are really large. You know, so the earliest planting we have going back into the late 50s, 1958 was Constantine's first planting. Um, and he really started with Chardonnay, Riesling, and Pinot Noir. And he expanded to over 60 different varieties from there. So we're really into experimentation. That's great. Yes, and we, uh, we have here one of our Chardonnay blocks. Mm -hmm. So you can see we haven't had pruning happen yet. We're sort of waiting a few more weeks to see what the winter will hold. Crossing our fingers, we don't have any really cold under negative 10, that's when we see some okay. big damage happen. So, and if I'm correct, um, and please correct me if yeah. I'm wrong, uh -huh. um, so Dr. Constantine, he originally grafted those vin uh, vinifera varieties onto American rootstocks, mm -hmm. right? Um, so is that, that's what we're seeing here? Correct, okay. yes, yeah. So that was really Constantine's legacy. He had earned a PhD uh, in Odessa, Ukraine. He had uh, basically devoted his life to viticulture and the science of vine growing and um, was a professor there, worked on a large estate. And during his time working in Eastern Europe, he actually had to deal with this pest called phylloxera microscopic course, little right. bug yeah right. um, it's very damaging obviously and uh, what he you know was practicing there was really tried and true practice in Europe grafting the, the American rootstock with vinifera the European variety that was uh, eliminating the phylloxera risk right and so that's something he introduced here when he arrived in New York he was a World War II refugee arrived with his family and um, what was missing in our region, we have a long history of producing, uh, producing wine, growing grapes, going back to the, the mid-1800s actually. But the varieties that were used were um, more varieties we associate with like jams and jellies. And so he was the first to really say, it's not just the cold, we can deal with the cold. I've dealt with the cold. It's <laughs> I mean, the pests and it's other the things pests, that come yeah. along with it, yes. of course. So introducing that grafting technique. Hello, I'm here with Richard, the owner of Forge Cellars. Thanks for having us. Happy to. One of the owners. My, my partner is uh, Louis Barol, who is a winemaker, uh, owner of an estate in Gigandas uh, called Chateau uh, St. Combe. Uh, we started Forge in 2011. And I. Excellent. Can you tell me a little bit more about the background of Forge and your partnership? Yeah, so I spent <laughs> a big chunk of my life, I was a French wine buyer uh, for an importer distributor on the East Coast. So I was spending, you know, 30, 45 days a year in France buying wine. And uh, that's where I met my partner, Louis. Uh, he was one of the growers I worked with. And uh, we were having lunch in Gigadas, and he asked me about the thing, these Finger Lakes where I lived. And I explained to him a bit about the terroir, the fact that we have this amazing Devonian shale, 350 million years old. We have these huge lakes, 40 miles long, that, that were really a, a, an interesting, cool climate wine region. And I went on and on, and, uh, and uh, this was back in 2009. And I said, hey, I'm gonna come see these lakes. Came up, fell in love with the region, and we were off to the races. Made our first wine in 2011. Uh, we, from the beginning, we just focused on bone dry Rieslings and a bit of Pinot as well. Uh, now I make also a little bit of tiny, tiny, tiny bit of Cab Franc and Chard, but uh, those are the only four varieties. But 85% of what we do is bone dry Riesling. Hi, I'm with Ashley Weiss. 
the owner of Vice Vineyards. And how are you doing today? Great, how about yourself? Thanks for having us. Can you tell us a little bit of history about Vice Vineyards? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so we opened in 2016 with my husband and I, Hans Peter Weiss, who's the winemaker of the duo. So you hear a lot about Peter. Of course, yep. Um, he's fantastic. He's from a small area in Germany, Zell on the Mosul River. His family's there. They have generations of winemaking. I think we've tracked it down that he's about seventh generation, but honestly, everyone over there makes a little bit of wine, so it's kind of difficult to get that lineage in order. And then his mother's side, they also made some wine as well, so he's got a little bit of winemaking everywhere. And he went to university for winemaking in Germany before he came to the States, which was in 2006, if I have that correct. Um, and he went for a vintage over in California, a winery called Chug, in the Canaris region of Sonoma. Um, and he came here to visit a friend, actually, and he met another wine owner and then came to the Finger Lakes and didn't leave. Yeah. Um, so he says it's kind of his home away from home. Uh, I am born and raised in the Finger Lakes. Hammondsport is my hometown, so this is where I grew up and lucky enough to find a career path where I could stay in the area. Hi there. Um, what I'm doing here today, well, we're getting ready for, for planting. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, we're going to uh, start planting up here at Weiss. And um, we have here, we're going to plant uh, a couple of things. Uh, Grüne Velina, what I have here. Uh, Chardonnay and uh, NY81. So it's a new, uh, new variety from, from Cornell. And what we're doing here, we're prepping. Um, so I just made sure the scissors are nice and sharp. So what I was saying before. Well, I always say like getting getting a little haircut, a little trim, and uh, make sharp so the roots are actually uh, not getting pinched. We like to have a nice sharp edge so the new roots will come out of that. And I try to do it like yeah, about ten centimeters uh, short. So then uh, the planter um, will get it nice. Uh, doesn't give any problems to the planter. Right, so what makes Vice Vineyard so special? What is unique about you all here in the Finger Lakes? Oh, that's a tough one, because honestly, every place in the Finger Lakes is pretty great, especially yeah. on Cuca, you know, special spot for us, because I feel like all the wineries here are really fantastic and have a, a relaxed, kind of chill vibe to them, which makes it really comfortable for people. One thing on uh, our side that's really important for us is no matter who comes in our door, whether that be, you know, someone who's at their first wine tasting or a Psalm, we offer them the same level of experience and you know really cater our tasting to their needs so that everyone feels comfortable we just want you know wine to be accessible with really good quality I'm here in the Seneca Lake AVA to dive deeper into the climate and the soil that makes the Finger Lakes so unique. These wines are true to their place and the growing environment plays a significant role in the wines that will be produced here. The Finger Lakes has a cool continental climate. This means the summers are warm and the winters are cold. Seneca Lake alone reaches over 650 feet deep. That's nearly 618 feet below sea level. These deep lakes create a warming effect in the winter, without which the grapevines could not survive. The lakes also have their own microclimate. They draw cool air from the surrounding sloped vineyards. This air warms and rises when it reaches the lakes, creating a vacuum, thus drawing in more cold air. This means that the cold air can delay bud bursts in the spring reducing the chance of damage from spring frost. The lake effect also extends the warm growing season and in the winter crea creates their own lake effect snow, which helps insulate the vines. Growers and producers know their vineyard very well because the position of their vines around the lakes will also play a major factor in the climate and growing environment. Hey, I'm here with Joe Hope, the sales manager of Vice Vineyards. 
Joe, thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Beautiful morning here in the Fair Lake. Yeah, Peter Weiss uh, purchased this vineyard about uh, two years ago. It was uh, about 25 acres, planted mostly of uh, some hybrids, some Nebraska, but also some really nice uh, Riesling and Chardonnay grapes. And that's what we have behind here. And um, the being here right uh, where the lake splits, this is uh, the bluff right here. Uh, the lake gives a really uh, moderating uh, effect on the grapes, keeps the, the, uh, the vines cool in the spring, so it prevents any uh, early bud break from being killed by a late frost. And then uh, in the fall, the lake being warm, uh, extends the growing season so they have full ripening. Uh, and it's really just a really nice spot for a vineyard. Um, so here we, our vineyard is called Bellows. Why? You know why now. You walk outside <laughs> and you get blown sideways. Of course. This, this area during the winter, uh, we get really pummeled from the, the winds coming out of Canada from the northwest. Okay. And that's and an important thing for you to see today is you feel this cold air coming out of the northwest. That's the typical winds of the winter. They would be even worse if we didn't have the Great Lakes to the north and the, the Finger Lakes. So what happens is this cold air comes down out of Canada. It hits the Great Lakes, which acts as a huge buffer, and it warms the air uh, because they don't freeze. And then you, the final piece of the puzzle is here, Seneca Lake, and that's what makes all this possible. Now, when you come back in the summer at some point, um, instead of having the winds come out of Canada, what we have um, all summer long is just the thermals. So the cool air is down on the lake, and then as the day heats up, it blows up the hill all day long. And then in the, about seven o'clock, it's like you can set your clock, all the cool air up in the forest above us, it reverses and it goes to the lake. It's, it's really quite amazing. The soils in the region are a direct result from the wave of glaciers thousands of years ago. The deep and fertile soils are comprised of limestone, shale, gravel, and silt. While most areas have deep soils that provide excellent drainage, some areas west of Seneca Lake have bedrock closer to the surface. You mentioned it a little bit, terroir is extremely important here in the Finger Lakes, and yeah. I noticed that we've got some <laughs> giant uh, rocks or sh uh, chunks of shale back yeah, here. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Well, you came at a fun time. We're uh, building another building, and so we had to do a bit of, bit of excavating, made our pond bigger. And uh, so what you see out here is literally just shale that's about two feet below the surface. So this is all Devonian period shale. And you see there's all these amazing colors of shale out here. Uh, and it's a very friable shale, so you can break it apart quite easy. It's like potato chips. And this is the mother rock, the mother rock of the region. This is what defines us. And uh, I, I think it's probably in, in North America, one of the few places where you find this amount of shale. So from a, from a winemaker's standpoint, this is amazing. And you can actually, on some of them, you can even see where the, the seas, uh, there's a chunk over there that's all polished on the top. So this all was formed, like I said, 300 million years ago when this region was south of the equator. Mm -hmm. These soils, um, I think, bring this freshness and almost saline character to a lot of the wines. So you have a lot of richness, you have a lot of texture, you have a lot of flavor, but you don't have heaviness. The soil looks very interesting. I noticed yes. we have, and this is, is this slate? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. this is a shale, shale. It's a type of shale, yep. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And and yes. what kind of role does that, that play, or how does that affect the vines, mm -hmm. keeping them warm, I'm sure? And yeah, absolutely. So this side, this west side of Cuca Lake, um, is really known for having a very high content of shale. Okay. And that is something, that's the story when Constantine was looking at the property, he, the story goes, he picked up, you know, a handful of soil and it had okay. all these rocks and he said, good soil. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he didn't speak any English when he right. arrived. So this was something that he really felt the soil, um, you know, was gonna be perfect for the style of wine he wanted to make. And absolutely, you know, when you touch one of these pieces of shale, 
you know, say in the growing season yeah. when the sun is beating down on it, you know, you can feel how hot oh, these sure. rocks are and it just helps with that heat retention. Um, we can get all, we want to get all the heat, you know, that we can to kind of re-radiate and, and create that warmth. Let's travel further into the Finger Lakes AVA, where we'll meet with producers along Seneca Lake and Cuca Lake. Here we'll discuss the impact these lakes have on viticulture and the grape varieties they grow. We'll also examine their individual take on vineyard management and winemaking techniques. Because of the fertile soils in the Finger Lakes and the sufficient amount of rainfall, the vines are often planted at low densities with large vines. Most vinifera vines are grafted onto American rootstocks, but there are still interesting native grapes and even hybrids. One of the most popular training and trellising systems is known as Scott Henry. This is where growers split the vine canopy to better allow for air circulation and sunlight, ultimately reducing the chance of fungal disease. Can you tell me a little bit about your trellising, um, pruning of the of the vines, mm -hmm. and, and even uh, this right here, this is hilling, right? Hilling up, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So you see, this is a VSP, vertical shoot positioning. That's mm -hmm. where a lot of our trellising um, is. We really want the uh, a lot of airflow to be able to, to go through the vine. Of course. Humidity can be a problem, you know, during the spring and, and the summer, the growing season. So to make sure that we have a well, sort of ventilated canopy is very very key um, and then the hilling up is critical because this is a step that without this growing the tender you know European varieties would be very challenging you know we are close to uh, this very deep lake Cuca Lake is at its deepest point 187 feet okay so it is very deep. We also have vineyards on Seneca Lake, which you're talking, you know, around over 600 feet deep, incredibly deep. Yeah. And these lakes have a moderating effect. So, um, you know, holding the heat, you know, past um, the summer right. to kind of help with uh, any winter, winter issues and then making sure that we don't warm up too quickly. And so the hilling up practice, we're basically, you know, pulling about a foot of soil to protect that graft union, which is the most vulnerable portion of the vine. Mm -hmm. And that without, you know, hilling up and insulating with soil, um, you know, you leave it vulnerable to, to more damage, you know, with our cold winters that we get here in the Finger Lakes. Of course, if you have snow, which you get a lot of, yes. uh, to use that as for insulation as well. Correct. Is that a technique you all use? Or? Yeah, okay. yeah, we welcome the snow. It's just the, the super, super cold temperatures mm. are where yeah. it gets tricky. But the snow actually does act as sort of like a blanket. It's no secret the Riesling is the most famous grape here. In fact, 950 acres alone are planted to Riesling, producing roughly 200,000 cases of Finger Lake Riesling a year. Of course, Chardonnay, Cabernet Franc, Pinot Noir, and Gewürztraminer are other popular varietals. It's also common to see varietals such as native grapes and French-American hybrids. The focus is typically on aromatic white varieties with high and fresh acidity. So I'm here with Sebastian from Domaine Le Cire and Bonjour. welcome, yeah, thank you, uh, thanks for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about your background from Champagne and how you came to the Finger Lakes? So I am from Champagne. My wife is from the south part of France, so we are both from like family wine history. And um, we always made wine or work in the vineyard since we are like little kids, you know. And um, it's always been like more like a passion that worked for us. You know, we, we never thought our parents were actually working or making wine, so it's kind of normal, you know. Um, we both study uh, a lot on the winemaking and viticulture, um, and then we traveled a lot to learn about wine. So we worked in Champagne, in Bordeaux, um, in Maury, in New Zealand, in Australia. And uh, one of our last trip was to come in the US to work for one year in a winery in the Finger Lakes. And uh, we enjoyed so much the area and the quality of the fruits. So we believed a lot in the terroir in this area, in the Finger Lakes. So we decided to stay and create our, our own winery. 
So that was in 2012. And what varietal of grapes are you selecting? So in the finger next, there is a wide varietal of grapes. So if you cut like France in half, you can do pretty much most of the one on the north part. Mm -hmm. So I believe a lot on the Chardonnays, uh, Cabernet Franc, Gevers Traminer. Those are really the grapes that really stand out to us. And um, after 10 years of trying and stuff, I'm like amazed every year that we can have those maturities, those flavor, those feelings on, on those varietals. So you mentioned, so this is Chardonnay right here. Mm -hmm. um, how about some of the other rows? Yes, yeah, so this um, kind of home farm, we have many different grape varieties. We have also Gewürztraminer a little further down. We have this ancient Georgian variety called Riccatitelli, mm -hmm. right, right behind us here. Um, that is just an incredible variety that Constantine had planted in Ukraine and brought it here to the United States. Um, one of the oldest grapes in the world. That's awesome. Super, super cool. That it's a white cool. grape. Um, we also have Cabernet Franc. We have Pinot Noir, Riesling, of course. Yeah. So we have a myriad of <laughs> different grape varieties Wonderful. within walking distance here. You know, we're really focusing on more of the northern European wine grapes. Mm -hmm. So things that can tolerate, you know, some colder, colder weather. But I would say, by and large, Riesling is the key <laughs> variety. And this is the grape that's like really put our region on the international wine stage. And also the diversity of styles. You know, yeah. we look at the soil, we look at the site. Um, you know, if there's some humidity and we get botrytis every year, we do some dessert styles oh, on those sites. Delicious. Yeah. Um, you know, we're also working with traditional method sparkling wines. So One of my favorites, perfect. Great, yeah, we're gonna have some I good wines to, to taste, taste on it. Yeah. So, and the last thing I really wanted to touch on was, is there anything new and exciting or any new varietals that you're, you're working with? Anything new that we should expect? Mm -hmm. One that we're really, really excited about is a red grape called Separavi. Ah, yes. <laughs> you know I've it. I've heard of it. you heard of it. Yes. So that is a red grape. It's another Georgian variety. Mm -hmm. And it's one that Constantine also introduced, you know, to our region here in the 1960s. And recently it's caught on a little bit in our yeah. region and we're seeing a lot more emphasis on the variety because it actually, it's a Tenturier variety, so it has colored juice. Mm -hmm. So it can produce a pretty full body, bold style, which yeah. is something that it's not always possible in our, in especially in cooler years. Of course, yeah. Um, but it, it has a lot of potential in this region. Cornell Hybrid. It's a Riesling Cave White Hybrid that was developed uh, quite a few years ago, named NY81031517. Not, not terribly memorable. I, I won't forget it. But uh, it's it's uh, a great grape that grows really really well here. Uh, it was first developed and planted on the bluff, which is. Uh, where the lake splits there and uh, there was only five acres we were using it all but we we're using it for a wine um, called heart of the lake because that's where the original vineyards were in the okay. heart of the lake so now that we've got some on the other side of the road here as well excellent so with hybrids we've got you know riesling chardonnay what are some other grape varietals that you all are excited about or maybe new plantings yeah uh, uh, Peter buys uh, grapes from about 22 growers around the Finger Lakes, uh, Cuca Lake, Cayuga Lake, Seneca Lake, uh, sometimes Guinea Atlas and Canandaigua. Okay. But uh, he loves, obviously, Riesling being the, uh, uh, the grape that he grew up working with in the, in the vineyards of, of the Mosul River. Uh, but uh, he's got some other things going, like uh, a Saparavi. Uh, does a lot of uh, really nice things with uh, Rosé, Cabernet Franc, okay. but then Grunerveld, Fleener, Diverse Fleener. Of course, got those a aromatic whole, whites. A whole lineup. Now it's time to discover how these producers make some of the finest wines and world-class Rieslings. Let's find out what techniques they use in the winery to bring to life these true examples of crisp, fresh, minerality-driven wines the Finger Lakes know and love. We'll also explore ice wine, a unique style of wine that requires late harvest grapes that freeze on the vines to concentrate the sugars and flavors. So Sebastian, can you tell us a little bit about the room that we're in and the winemaking in general, the barrels that we have here? So for the wine, it's very important to preserve your wine on the best condition possible. So here we control the humidity, the temperature, 
and we have all of our barrels for the reds uh, and we did a lot of selection. So it's not because someone tells you this barrel works well in California, this barrel works well in France or whatever. You need to try the barrel that works with your grapes. So on the first year we try on the first year we try maybe 50 to 60 different kinds of barrels. So that was a lot of trying but now it's worth it. We know which barrel works with each type of wines and that's how we make our wines. So when you see a pile like this, I don't know if we can back up, usually we have a third of newer barrel, brand new, a third of newer that are a little bit like two to three years old, okay. and then a set of older ones. When you blend those wines together, after you have a really good balance, and that's what we are looking for. And in terms of oak, what we prefer, it's a forest around Troncé area, so very, very tight grain that give a slow release of the oak into the wine. Okay. And that is the reason why we do very long aging. So on our uh, white, it's one year usually, and on the red, it's two years. So in two years, you really have the time for the oxygen to go through the oak, and it will smooth the tannins out. So picture that your tannins are like a square. Mm -hmm. On the first year, when you try it, it's like very astringent, very hard, harsh tannins. And when you give it time on the oak, it gives like the oxygen through the oak and it smooths the tannin, it cuts the corner. So at the end you are like a ball. And when you taste the wine after that, you are like, wow, this is how we need to do it. And, and why is it obviously stainless steel is also a very popular technique, um, but you prefer oak. Why is that? It's just like, I feel like the wine gets get more life, more emotion into it. It's the same feeling you touch a barrel. Yeah, of course. You have some texture, it's not super cold. You touch stainless, it's cold, it's like, oof, you don't want to be in this spot. You want to be in this spot, touching all kinds of stuff. Of course, and that, that makes sense. That's why you have a tasting room with the barrels. You don't have a bunch of stainless steel around here. There really is something special about the barrels themselves, whether it's visually pleasing or, or for making a beautiful wine. That's the beauty. So we wanted, when people come in our tasting room, we wanted them to be in the winery. So actually right now in this room we have people that are enjoying their tasting and food and they are with the barrel and it's part of the experience in our place. Winemaking here, we do everything to do very little is kind of the philosophy. So combination of hand harvest, machine harvest, into press, very slow press, four or five hours. We settle in steel overnight. And then uh, about 85% of the wines go into neutral barrel. Um, in a lot of different sizes, but these big 500s here, I have some 600s, I have the traditional 228. A lot of these come from our estate in France when they're old. So these are all on average around uh, nine years old, up to 12. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't have an impact um, on flavor, they just have an impact on how the wine ages. Everything is spontaneously fermented, so we use the ambient yeast in the air. We don't use uh, we don't use commercial yeast, um, and then they ferment quite slowly through the winter. A lot when when we came in here, you can smell some fermentation still yeah, going. Nice. They'll finish in April typically. Then we'll start to do the blends, and we'll put everything together. And we typically bottle late in the summer, and then we typically don't release until the following year, okay. so the wines can have some bottle age to relax. And, and how does that, um, now, is there a different process or a different maturation um, time for different blocks or different vineyards? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, it's like a chapter uh, in a book, right? We have this book, which is the Finger Lakes. But on the east side of Seneca here, where we are, we have all these little chapters, and each site is its own story, its own chapter in this bigger book. And the idea is to kind of get out of the way and let the Riesling from this site express itself. Riesling is, for me, a vehicle that tells the story. If we're doing our work well, the varietal becomes very secondary. What becomes very important is the place. So, Megan, can you tell me a little bit about the building that we're standing in front of? Absolutely. So this building dates back to 1886. It was one of New York's first wineries called the uh, Western New York Wine Company. So very literal name. We are in Western of course, New York. Yeah. <laughs> it was a German family that immigrated here and they were producing wines from Concord. Uh, unfortunately, as many wineries, um, as many wineries did, they went into business during Prohibition. Yeah. And then my grandfather, who was the, the son of Constantine, purchased the property in the 1970s, renovated the cellars, and had a dream of producing world-class, traditional method sparkling wines. 
and that's what we continue to this day. Excellent, so can we go check them out? Let's check it out, come on. All right, so let's check out the cellar downstairs. All right, so here we are in our sparkling cellar. So we do only traditional method, Meta Champenois production of sparkling here. We produce seven different styles of sparkling wines. Um, we do, you know, basically the picking by hand. We then do the primary fermentation at our main winery next door. And then we bottle typically March of the following year into this very strong thick glass because it's gonna to have to withstand two fermentations, the second being in this bottle, mm -hmm. the glass has to be super, super strong. <laughs> so we bottle that still wine with a tiny bit of yeast and a little bit of sugar, and then we cap it with a crown cap. So um, we're gonna do the secondary fermentation. The yeast is gonna eat the sugar provided, add a little bit more alcohol, um, and then result in a dry sparkling wine because the carbon dioxide is trapped in the bottle, it re-dissolves into the wine, yeah. So basically at this stage, we have all of the bottles entourage sort of waiting. Uh, they're going through the yeast autolysis process where uh, the dead yeast cells from the secondary fermentation are breaking down and creating that brioche kind of toast bread kind of biscuity, biscuity yeah, of aromas and flavors, which we love. You know, after a few years, we're ready. <laughs> to get yep. the wine off the leaves and we can't sell it obviously with that grainy kind of uh, sediment so we need to get that out of the bottle and the way that the first step of the way we do that is riddling so we have these riddling racks but basically for about two weeks push and turn quarter turn and that gets that, that yeast deposit to the bottom or to the neck right exactly All so right. the yeast is going to swing down like a pendulum into the neck you can see Very it. Cool. Yes. So about how long do you age the bottles um, or the wine on their on its leaves? Yeah, so it depends on the program. So our minimum is two years and we go all the way up to ten years for a prestige cuvee. So okay. it really depends on the wine. So while we're down here, can you talk a little bit about make, uh, your wine making methods yeah. for some of the still wines? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so a lot of our production is aromatic whites. Okay. So it's about 80% of what we do. You know, Riesling, Gruner Veltliner, Pinot Gris, uh, Gewürztraminer. So we're talking wines that are very much made in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And we're looking to highlight and accentuate the varietal characteristics. So meaning um, maybe a little skin, like a pre-soak, uh, some skin contact time okay. prior to fermentation for some varieties like Gewürztraminer, right. uh, a bit with Riesling, Muscat Atenel, we do a little skin contact. And then looking at a really nice, cool fermentation, with using specific yeast strains that are gonna work well with the variety. Excellent. So using a lot of German yeast strains um, that are gonna accentuate those floral, citric, apple, pear kind of aromas and flavors. All the reds are aged in French oak. They're 100% French oak barrels. Uh, not using any American. Uh, he likes to age them for approximately 18 to 20 months. Um, combination of new and used oak. With the reds, he's usually doing 20 to 25 percent new oak, uh, and then the rest would be uh, uh, used uh, two, three-year-old barrels. Uh, the Chardonnay, uh, he uses a technique that he uh, picked up when he was doing his internship, internship in Sonoma, where uh, the uh, the Chardonnay is put into barrels that are ranging from brand new to five years okay. old. And then that way you get about 20% new oak. And wh which wines are seeing just the, the stainless steel, I'm sure, the more the aromatic whites? Yes, absolutely. The, the, the Riesling, the Gruner Veltliner, the Gewurz uh those are all, uh, all in stainless steel. Um, we do do an on oak Chardonnay as well. Okay. Uh, and then wines such as uh, Blau Frankish Cabernet Franc. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, we also do a, a, a Zweigelt. Uh, those are all uh, going through that approximately 20 months of aging in French oak. The Chardonnay is in this tank here, which is uh, going to be an unoaked Chardonnay. Oh, I'm sorry. But you can see it's still got, you know, 
Some of it, it's still a little cloudy, little, little uh, yeast cell still there. Yeah, and you can still smell that that, that yeast is mm -hmm. still pretty present. But this will, you know, be probably another few months in the tank and okay. a, a, a bottling later this summer. Excellent. But you know, again, nice fruit, bright, crisp, uh, and then uh, the barrel-aged Chardonnay is already in barrel, and that'll be bottled later, probably in the fall. This is a, a Blau. It's a little lighter in color. And then we've got one that's um, from a different vineyard in another tank, and then another tank further down that has uh, all been uh, aged in new oak. Okay. So these three different batches will come together as one, uh, each having a different... Uh, and this being the lightest, and you can tell with the color, it's mm -hmm. very you know, mm -hmm. uh, transparent. And Okay, and I know you guys make a killer ice wine. Can we talk a little bit about, maybe even from the vineyard to the you know to the actual tasting room of ice wine? What what's that all about? Sure, ice wine is uh, obviously wine made from the grapes that were left on the vines uh, after the final harvest. At the end of the season, they'll they'll leave some vines, some grapes on the vines, in hopes to make ice wine. Mm -hmm. You have to have a few things going in your in your favor to make ice wine. First, you have to keep the the, the birds off and so you have to net them. You have to hope that they don't get too ripe and fall off to hit the ground. Uh, and, and last of all, you've got to have a hard freeze. It's got to be about 17 degrees uh, or lower for a couple days. Okay. So the longer they hang on the vine, the sweeter they get. Water starts to evaporate. And then when they're picked, it's about three in the morning. They um, go out, they're like marbles. Pick them, crush them, any water content left yeah. Uh, is, is left behind and you have this really special nectar that makes a, a fabulous ice wine. We certainly can't travel all the way to the Finger Lakes without tasting the wines. We've explored the time and effort it takes to make these impressive wines, so now let's experience them and enjoy them. So you made 13 different Riesling in 2020, <laughs> lots of different vineyards. That's a little, that's a lot for, for yeah. someone to, to get their head uh, through. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's it, like I, I always say, I do probably need some therapy um, because why? Why would we do this? And I'll, I'll tell you, when you open them all up side by side, uh, I've yet to have anybody say, oh, these two taste somewhere. Their, their head kind of explodes because they say, gosh, there's so much variation. And I'm like, now you know why we do it. Um, it's not certainly for marketing purposes. Yeah. It's it's about storytelling. And I think um, that there's there's so many different stories. And, and when you have these wines with some food, uh, your head's going to really go crazy. Matter of fact, look, uh, like it was Perfect. meant to be. <laughs> Thank you. So we have some, we have some amazing aged uh, cheddar from Vermont. And we have some nice little uh, ash washed chev from Loire, okay. a little bit of fig chutney, and uh, some nuts. But then we have even some pata negra from Spain. Delicious. So the exercise we're going to do now is narrow down in one hamlet called Kaywood two different vineyards. Perfect. And I want to show you that within the same hamlet, li literally within a stone's throw, how they can change. The one vineyard is uh, from a dear friend of mine, John Wagner. It's called Wagner K. Wood East. This is a higher altitude vineyard on shale. Lots of shale. We'll start with that one. This is always the most kind of stony of all the wines we make. Ooh, the, the signature aromas of, of Wagner are all this, this kind of rocky and stony minerality. Oh yeah. Yeah, that that, and that wet stone, wet that stone, slaty. Yeah. And if you can't afford Chablis right now, Chablis, this is a this is a great substitute for Chablis. And you see the salinity. Oh yeah, the salty. Absolutely, it's great because it gives this freshness. The wine's dense, man. There's a lot going on there. The wine has a lot of richness, a lot of texture, but it's still very light. 
with the saltiness and, and, and the acidity and the brightness. So now the next one, across the street, literally, and it's called Kaywood. This is a really interesting site that I spoke of earlier that I'm so happy to, to be working in. A good buddy of mine, Rob, who lives right up the street here, farms it. And uh, this was a site that was planted in the early 70s, actually by his father. You have very old vines in a cold climate, uh, white vines, that's not typical, because usually they die after 15, 20 years. Because Kwood was driven by stone, driven by mineral, and then K Wagner Kwood East. Right. And then Kwood is driven by this herbal savoriness you find like thyme, wild carrot, all these different aromas. It's not driven by fruitiness, it's driven by kind of wild herbs. Excellent. Oh yeah, you can tell right away off the nose, yeah, the dried herbs or you know, rosemary thyme. Yeah, crazy, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of wild carrot in this vineyard. Interesting. So it has this, sometimes this wild carrot and, and thyme aromas. One more bottle. So this is called Classique. And what is Classique? Classique, uh, I love this wine because it's our most important wine because it embodies everything we do from forage to our growers that we work with. It's one barrel of every single site we work in. So everybody's in this bottle. So it's truly like a snapshot of the southeast side of Seneca, of forage, of the vintage, and all the growers. And sometimes, if you taste all the single vineyards, you'll pick up elements in here. I was just going to say, I mean, if it's a, a combination of everything, you're going to get some of the, the saltiness, some of the, totally. the stone fruit, I mean, a little bit of everything. Yep. You yep. can already smell it, yeah. And this is a wine for me. Um, it's price point, it's, we would consider this kind of our entry level wine. But you notice I had it at the end. Yeah. And the reason is, I like to show all the parts and then here is the sum of the parts yeah and i wanted this wine always to be a wine that most people can afford to drink maybe monday through thursday right and then the days where they have more time and they're having longer meals with with friends family maybe on friday saturday something. sunday yeah. they can have the single vineyards they're, they're so versatile and there's so much about each individual bottle and each individual wine it's and then, of course, the classy, you can put it all together, get a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah, it's so, the combo pack. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let's have, uh, let's eat now. Sounds good. All right. All right, Sebastian, we've got a couple of Graverse Demeanor, which is very unique for the U.S. Um, which one should we start with? Always start with the unoaked one, on what I believe, you know, mm -hmm. so we, let's go with the Gewurztraminer, Cuvée Classic. So this one, uh, the terroir is on the sandy soils, so like, as soon as you have a rain, the water wash, and it's super, super dry. Mm. So then, it helps to concentrate the fruits. And Gewurztraminer, you need concentration. The flavor are very, very powerful. So you need the concentration of the sugar and the acid to have something to balance against the flavor, you know. So having higher alcohol and a nice acidity is extremely important for this kind of wine. And in the finger legs, we have the perfect condition for those grapes, you know. Okay. So more on the floral character, little spices. Well, and that's what I was going to say. It's very pronounced, uh, yeah. floral, yeah, jasmine, some spice, herbs. And again, a lot of mouthfeel because we do a lot of stirring on the leaves to give the structure, you know. Really a foodie wine. And you got the rose petals, the lychee. Of course. Nice structure. Maybe a little off dry, maybe a few a grams tad of, bit sugar. of sugar. Okay, but yeah. you, I think you need it with the acidity that you have because yeah. it's so fresh, you know. And so the, the next one is <coughs> an oaked uh, crevice remainder. Oak, so that came out of a trial. Um, picture that's, you know, we have tanks. Mm -hmm. So we put the Gavir Straminer for this one in a tank and it came out of an accident pretty much. And I had like, a little bit too much to fit in the tank and it could not fit on another one. Okay. So I was like, oh, I just have enough to make one barrel. So okay. let's try it. So I just fill the barrel with it. And as it was developing on the barrel, we were tasting it. We were like, wow, it's cool, you know? And it's pretty interesting to, um, to try because you got even more structure. 
and really again food pairing wine. You know, it's really wine that is made to pair with food. And again, that oak just adds that that texture, that creaminess, that body, um, but still that long, long finish. You're still getting those floral notes. So, like you said, it's still delicate. It's still preserved. Um, it's absolutely delicious. Yeah. We just need to have more food, so let's get some food. Let's now. do it. <laughs> we're, we're here at Kindred Fair in Geneva, a spot that you cannot miss with locally sourced food and sustainable ingredients. Let's go give it a shot. All right, so here we have the roasted duck breast. Uh, we've got a, a amazing, it smells delicious, the uh, sweet potato cauliflower hash and a uh, cauliflower truffle uh, cream. Of course, we've got the fried egg on, fried egg on it. Um, all these ingredients are locally sourced, sustainable, and everything's right here uh, from the Finger Lakes itself. Of course, we can't forget the forage sellers. Um, this is gonna be their, uh, their peach orchard um, vineyard, so it's their uh, single vineyard uh, Riesling, brilliant wine, it's from right off of Seneca Lake, it's the closest vineyard to the lake, so it's nice and warm, it heats up nice and quick, 2020 was a great vintage, a nice warm year, so this wine is going to pair perfect with that, with those ripe, uh, rich uh, fruit flavors. Let's give it a shot. So good. Cheers. So Megan, um, we've got a couple wines here. Can you maybe tell me a little bit about them? Or maybe we should start with the bubbles? Let's do it. Yeah, so let's start with our sparkling. So this is our 2019 Blanc de Blanc. So 100% Chardonnay. And this one, year after year, I know I should have been favorites, but this is one of my favorites. That's okay for bubbles That's to be okay, favorites. That's okay, yeah. So a traditional method, we just released this vintage of 2019. And um, it just, I think the Blanc de Blanc style in the Finger Lakes mm -hmm. is really very elegant, you know, coming from this region, you know, for us, we were looking for that really nice kind of citric floral character with a little bit of that you know the the lees aging brioche toast of course and that's what i was going to say that that nose that bouquet mm -hmm. is, is beautiful citrus fruit uh -huh. you know orange yep. lime zest in there but you're right there's like that that subtle like undertone of mm -hmm. the biscuity brioche aromas mm -hmm. that's really beautiful well, cheers, Connor. Welcome cheers. To the finger Lake. thank you <laughs> I That's love that delicious. acidity yeah, you feel that, right that here. Is, that high acid, mm -hmm. jaw tingling. It's got yes. a great finish though. It does. It's uh, it's tart. It's, it's juicy. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of a lot of the citrus fruit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A little grapefruit in there yeah. towards the end. That's delicious. Oh, I'm so glad you like it. And that the the sugar is, is balanced perfectly. Mm -hmm. What can I? What, yeah. What's the dosage or what's the, sh yes. the sugar that we're looking sure. at? It's obviously very low. It is low. Yeah. So this is dosed to eight grams per liter. Okay. So it's it's right quite low. Like sweet spot. Yes, absolutely. And that's a really nice balance because of the high acid to have that balance. Yeah, it's really well balanced. Dosage. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's delicious. All right, Megan, so I'm curious about this wine. I've heard yeah. a lot about it, mm -hmm. and I know it's something that's very unique mm -hmm. to, to the winery here. Yes. Can you tell me a little more? Absolutely, Connor. So um, we do do some red wines as well, even though our specialty is really aromatic wines and sparkling wines. But this is a very unique grape called Saparabi. And what's really cool about this wine and this grape, as you can see, has a really deep, dark color. So actually the pulp of the grape Saparabi is mm. colored. So in Georgia, it means tinted. It has a uh, colored juice. And that's not very common, right? That is not. Um, it's called a tenturi variety. There's only a handful in the world. So it is very cold hardy because it's widely grown, yeah. you know, in Eastern Europe. But it produces a really interesting, very full-bodied wine 
that when you pair it with some oak maturation, it has a really bright acidity, mm -hmm. but also can be very bold and very spicy, and, and it has a lot of, you know, black fruits and, and blue fruits. It's, it's very, I think, a very interesting. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, you're, you're right, and you can tell that, that oak, that, that spice, a little cinnamon. Mm -hmm. um, it's got beautiful texture, tannins. Um, they're, they're smooth, mm -hmm. but they're, they're noticeable. Um, how long is this aged in, in oak? Yeah. So this is an extended period, so okay. 18 months in French oak. Okay. So this is delicious. I'm so glad, Connor. Well, cheers. cheers. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, there you have it. The New York Finger Lakes is a remarkable wine region. With the beauty and serenity of the lakes and the culture and lifestyle, there's no wonder why fantastic wine became ingrained in this community. Thanks for joining me on this incredible journey. Until next time, many cheers.